Lord, we're grateful for this hour to be in your presence, in your house. Amen. I'd like to read a few verses of scripture this morning from the book of John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. When the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of those words for this morning. If you were to make a list <clears throat> of the jobs that require the ability to think on your feet and to handle extreme levels of stress, which jobs would you uh, put on your list? Uh, each list would vary, but uh, how about a fighter pilot? I mean, from you know, he's got he's got to have his wits about him. How about police officers? Man. And the list can go on. I think kindergarten teachers ought to be on that list. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, the mother. What about wedding planners? You ever think about that? Wedding planners juggle hundreds of tiny details while also managing the emotions of the wedding party. Their job is to create the perfect day for the bride and groom. And that's a huge responsibility. Now, when issues come up at the last minute, the wedding planner has to do whatever it takes to redeem that situation. And things do come up. For example, the DJ don't show up for the reception. What do you do? Well, one wedding planner hooked up her iPhone to a laptop computer, and she served as the DJ and everything went on without a hitch. Another wedding planner discovered that at the last minute, the church had scheduled a funeral at the same time as the wedding. Now, she needed to keep this wedding, the wedding gifts out of the church for at least an hour. Fortunately, she spotted an ice cream truck down the block, went down and asked the guy and convinced him to come up close to the church and serve ice cream to the wedding guests. And everybody had a good time. Everybody assumed that it was just part of the uh, wedding entertainment. The guests had a great time. And no one guessed that they were being distracted from a scheduling mistake. Now, our scripture today is about a wedding planner. And he's faced with a crisis. Jesus and his disciples and his mother Mary are attending a wedding in Cana of Galilee. In that culture, wedding parties lasted for days. Days. And at some point during the festivities, you see, 
the hosting family ran out of wine. Jesus lived in a culture that valued hospitality and community. It was big. No more wine meant no more wedding. No more wedding celebration. And that could be very humiliating for the bride and groom's families. Jesus' mother must have heard a whisper in the crowd. She's milling around, and she hears something about them having no more wine. So what's she do? She takes it to Jesus. Now this is the way I think it, this is the way I think it went. They're in this, they're in this hall, okay? And Mary hears a little scuttle, but they have no more wine. This can't be. I'm going to tell Jesus. So she searches the place and she's looking at everything. She, sits, she spots him over in the corner. And Jesus is sitting there and there's some people around him like always was, you know, and he's either talking with them or he's teaching. So she kind of sidles over, you know, and goes through, hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? And she gets over there and she gets right beside him and she stands. Now Jesus is there and all of a sudden he realizes that there's somebody standing there. They weren't there before. And, and, and he kind of looks and then he looks up and it's his mother. And at that point, Mary looks at him and says, they have no more wine. And Jesus answered her, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Mary's next thing that she said was not to Jesus. It was to the servants that are always dispersed around the place and looking to anything that has to be done. And she said, do whatever he tells you. And then she out the door. That's what she did. This passage is a great example of what I would call mom power. You know what I'm talking about. Mom power. Mothers have the unique power to talk their kids into doing their bidding. Mary didn't ask Jesus directly to do anything. She didn't demand anything. She just presented the problem to him in such a way that he could not say no. That's mom power. Believe it. Remember this. Jesus has the power to do miracles. He could have produced gallons of wine in the, in the tip of a hat or the blink of an eye. But that's not the tack that he took. No, no, no. He decided to involve others in rescuing this situation. He's going to use some other people. Now, if you read through the Bible... God often asks very ordinary people to assist in his work. <clears throat> God partners with us to do miracles, but God chooses those who trust him. Okay? It's always, it always requires an attitude of trust and an act of faith to partner with God in doing his work. Those two things are important. And so Jesus asked the servants to fill the ceremonial water jars to the very brim. Now these jars are big. They hold 20 to 30 gallons of, of water. He said, fill them up to the brim. And then he told one of the servants to draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Big thing. Now, don't you feel sorry for the, those servants? Think about it. The master of the banquet was essentially the wedding planner, okay? And uh, he was facing public humiliation, uh, loss of his job if he didn't come through real fast. He had to come up with some wine. So the servants showed tremendous trust when they obeyed Jesus and took a host, the host a dipper of this wine in these water jars now. Imagine now the master of the banquet uh, and how surprised he was when he tasted the wine that the servants brought him. 
He didn't even know Jesus performed a, a miracle. He may not have even known Jesus. We don't know. But after he tasted the wine, he called the bridegroom. And he said, everybody brings out the good stuff first. And then after everybody gets kind of lit, then you bring out the cheap stuff. But you, you have saved the best till last. You know, it's easy to look at Jesus' first miracle and think it's just an impressive party trick. Just a party trick. We might as well end this passage with, and they lived happily ever after the end. It's a party trick. But the last line in the Bible, in the, in the verse, says this. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed him. What? <laughs> I call that a very important miracle, don't you? It was the first of the signs of what was about to come. <clears throat> Dr. Stephen Arterborn is a nationally known psychi psychiatrist, and he was raised in a very strict Christian home. <clears throat> and his parents absolutely forbid the use of alcohol in their home. When Stephen was old enough, he asked them to explain Jesus' first miracle, the transformation of water into wine. Stephen's dad replied, well... If he had known how many problems alcohol was going to cause, he probably wouldn't have done that. And some of us would agree with his dad. I'm telling you, we would. This miracle is a little hard to explain, and not just because many churches in the United States are traditionally um, hard on, 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 on the, uh, their stand on alcohol. But it's not about the wedding, you see. This, this is not about a wedding. This is not about a wine, the wine. And it's not about being a showman. I mean, God wasn't desperate for attention. He's not desperate for attention. So the miracles we read about in the Bible aren't just special effects to impress us. They're not. Miracles are meant to show us the nature and the priorities of God. Every time you read about a miracle in the Bible, ask yourself this, what does this tell me about the nature and the priorities of God? What's he trying to tell me here? And the first thing this story tells us about God is that in Jesus, God is doing a new thing. <coughs> Pardon me. Notice in the Bible that every time God speaks to a person, it's a challenging event. Something's happening. Something has to happen. Something's going to happen. And so he talks to people. Because God is always calling people to a new life or a new identity or a new challenge. You look at the lives of the many people in the Bible, what happened to them. How about Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Ruth, Esther, Joseph, David? Each one of them was called away from a very comfortable life. They had a comfortable life going and a very predictable future too. But he called them away to follow him, to take on new challenges. And God expects the people who follow him to grow and to change and to rise to new challenges, to sacrifice their comforts for His calling. And speaking of challenges, COVID-19 has certainly presented us with a whole bunch of challenges that we didn't have before. And we soon would like to forget them, for sure. And we added some new terms to our vocabulary, such as social distancing. It's almost a cuss word to me. 
and some new ways of going about our work. I mean, businesses sent their employees home. Some of you are working from home now that you never did before, and you may never go back to the office. Restaurants, stores, schools closed their doors. Pretty soon, some of us were getting quite depressed looking at the same four walls every day and every day. That's one way you can deal with a challenge like this, like that. I mean, you can get down, and you can get in the dumps, and you can get resentful, and you can get mean, and just terrible. Or maybe you can find a better way to deal with your situation. I read about a husband and wife team who rose to that occasion and did something. They found a better way. When they got bored staring at the same four walls in their house, the couple created a website called Window Swap. Window Swap. Now, Window Swap allowed users to upload photos or videos of the view outside their window. Whatever window you wanted to pick. Then, when they got tired or bored with the view from their home, they could click through the other photos or videos of the other people's views from around the world. You know, pick somebody in England. Look out their window. The woman said, my husband and I were growing very bored with the view from our window, so we created a place on the Internet where you could go and open up a new window somewhere else in the world. And when I read this, I thought, boy, I would love to look out the window of my apartment, our apartment, friend and I lived in Germany. I would just love to live out, look out that window again. I think it would be so cool. In Jesus, God opened a new window so we could see his nature in a brand new way. In Jesus, God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. And the second thing we learn from this miracle is that in Jesus, God is doing an abundant thing. Why is it so important to understand that God is a God of abundance? It's not to justify the prosperity gospel that we hear spewed all over the television all the time, or the health and wealth worship found in many American churches. It's not that. In Jesus, we see God's generosity. It flows, from <coughs> it flows from his love for us. God's abundant love frees us to live fearlessly and expectantly and generously. That last one is most important. This is another area where God calls us into partnership with him. We receive God's blessings so that we can be a blessing to others. A man named Dale Schroeder was a carpenter from Iowa who lived to be a blessing to other people. He worked at the same company for 67 years. Dale was known to be a hardworking, humble, and frugal. After he died in 2005, Steve Nielsen, the executor of his will, revealed that Dale had saved up nearly, get this, he's a carpenter, $3 million in his lifetime and let all his money to the, pay for small town Iowa kids to go to college. In all, his fortune sent 33 kids to college. None of these kids could have afforded a college education on their own, but today they are doctors and lawyers and therapists and teachers in their communities. According to Steve Nielsen, Dave, Dale Schroeder had just one condition for accepting the money. All we ask is that you pay it forward, he said. He said you can't pay it back because Dale's gone but you can remember him and you can emulate him. And that's what we do when we give generously to the needs of others. We pay it forward to emulate 
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because that's what He did. Jesus is God in the flesh and His miracles point to the nature and priorities of God. In this Bible passage, we learn that God is doing a new thing and He is doing an abundant thing. And the last thing we learn from this miracle is that Jesus, in Jesus, God is doing a grace thing. A grace thing. Grace. What's grace? <clears throat> Unconditional, unearned love. And it's hidden all throughout the Bible. And it is particularly on display in the miracle of the turning of water into wine. <clears throat> wine often symbolizes God's provision and blessing and security in the Bible. But it also represents so much more. You see, Jesus' first miracle and his last meal have a very lot in common. Just before Jesus was arrested and crucified, he had a final meal with his disciples. And after the meal, he picked up some leftover bread and gave thanks over it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he picked up the cup of wine and he said, this cup of the new covenant the new promise in my blood, which is poured out for you. God in the flesh didn't come here to save a wedding party from disaster. He came to give his life on the cross to save us from our sins and to restore us to himself. That's why he came. Jesus' first miracle wasn't for show. It was to show us that in his coming, in his life, in his death, for our sakes, Jesus was doing a new thing, an abundant thing, and a grace thing. His broken body and the wine of the Eucharist are constant reminders of Jesus' courageous love for us. Don't you want to know God like that? You know people that would like to know a God like that? Don't you want to be a part of His work? See what new things, abundant things, and grace-filled things God can do for you in your life. Amen? Amen. You know, we've seen all those great things. We're Christians. We, you know, we were raised in it. There's people out there who don't know, don't know. And he's given this, given us this, this job to reach out to those that don't know Jesus and to tell them about Jesus. God has done great things and he continues to do great things. And we need to be a part of that. And we need to be part of it more than just coming and sitting in the red pews. We need to reach out to our neighbors, our friends, and people we work with. People we don't maybe really know all that well, but are hurting. We know, we see them. They're here. They're all around. So we just ask that, that God would guide us in everything that we do, that we may reach out to those people who are in need. And in so doing, we renourish ourself in the Christian life. And so that's the charge as we lead today. Reach out. God has done great things in our lives. Let's do something now to help out somebody else's life. And I just want to say one thing. Be happy. Be grateful. And be careful this week when you're out in the weather. Do something for somebody, but be careful. But be grateful for the opportunity. Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Lord God, we, we just thank you so much that 
we have the ability and the, the honor of coming to your house. We thank you for that. And we just ask that you would go with us now, each into our own way. Guide, guard, and direct us until we meet again. Amen.